Okay, I think we'll uh, be getting started now. A lot of time for both a presentation and discussion of the presentation. I want to welcome everybody back and wish you a happy new year. It's already been momentous for several reasons. We're going to get back to thinking about uh, the impact of the environment on, and uh, health and welfare on the brain as an organ and on the body and person. Uh, we're thrilled to have with us Mark Berman from the University of Chicago. We've had a fascinating couple of discussions with him already this morning, uh, talking about some of his work. As you can see on the screen, he's got a number of titles I won't go through. He's also got a number of awards that I could also list for you uh, in terms of acknowledgement of his, his very interesting work in thinking about how to apply computational models and statistical models, bringing into his training from uh, psychology into neural uh, brain networks and thinking about how things such as green space and other interactions can affect the body and mind. Uh, we have a, a lot of fascinating issues to discuss, so I won't uh, take any more of your time telling you all about Mark. I'll let Mark tell you all about uh, the work he's been doing and all about Mark. So please welcome Dr. Berman. It's all yours. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ed and Megan, for inviting me um, to, to speak here. And uh, I've really enjoyed my conversations with many of you so far and uh, look forward to sharing uh, some of my research with you now. Um, so I thought that just to outline today, I was going to talk a little bit about um, how we think about this field of environmental neuroscience and then talk about two particular applications of our environmental neuroscience approach. So one, looking at the effect of urban green space on mental and physical health. Uh, and then in another line of work, looking at actually how city size and how the infrastructure of cities changes as they get larger and how that actually uh, affects uh, mental health and in particular depression. So what do I mean by environmental neuroscience? Um, we certainly are not the first people to do environmental neuroscience. It's been, been around for, for a while. Um, it was interesting to learn that Megan's advisor at University of Illinois was Bill Greeno, who's um, one of my sort of heroes, along with Donald Hebb um, and Rosenweig and people like, uh, like that that did research um, mainly on non-human animals and how the environment um, and environmental enrichment uh, could change um, brain physiology. And uh, I was always really inspired by that work. And it's also kind of interesting to me why um, sort of when we looked at humans, we sort of failed to realize uh, how much the physical environment that surrounds us actually impacts our brains and our behavior. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a little cartoon from a paper that we wrote um, talking about environmental neuroscience and how if we move from left to right on the screen here, uh, we're interested in quantifying aspects of the physical environment, such as the amount of green space or disorder in the environment and how that might relate um, to different psychological conditions and health. Um, we're also very interested in sort of going uh, to indoor environments because actually in North America now, we spend 90% of our time indoors. Uh, and potentially there's a lot of aspects about our indoor environments that's affecting our psychology and behavior. Where we're really interested in how these physical environment characteristics affect our social interactions and how we interact with each other. And then continuing to go uh, down, we do kind of take a little bit of a mechanistic approach where we're interested in brain processes and brain networks and even down to the epigenome to see how these physical environmental effects affect our, our physiology. But we're not just interested in taking this sort of reductionistic approach from left to right, but we're also interested in sort of a generative approach that basically if you know somebody's physiology, uh, you know about their brain structure and function, what kind of environments will they thrive in? Um, could we sort of optimize physical environments to bring the best out in people um, and to have the sort of the best psychological outcomes? And that's sort of moving from right to left. And in our lab, we're just scratching the surface, but in essence, this is what we want to try to do. And in the middle here, you can see that, you know, we believe that behavior is a function of genetics, neurobiology, psychology, and the environment. 
I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, Kurt Lewin uh, in the 1930s, you know, said that human behavior is a function of the person and the environment. And I think what we want to do is take Lewin's equation and actually take it from a heuristic, which it really is, and to make it into an equation that in the, at the end of the day, we would love to be able to talk about these things in quantitative terms, uh, to actually be able to map out the relationships between uh, aspects of our neurobiology, genetics, psychology, and the environment onto our subsequent behavior. So that, that's sort of the goal. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big goal. We're not gonna be able to do it on our own. And, and we're hoping that um, we can sort of build this field together to make a lot of progress here. Uh, and from talking with a lot of you today, I can see there's a lot of synergy between how you guys think about the physical environment and how it affects health and behavior. Um, this is uh, by definition a multi-scale science. So um, I apologize, this figure is a little bit low resolution, uh, but basically on the y-axis, you're seeing different spatial scales at the highest scale, looking at cities, to local social interactions, to the brain, to individual neurons. And on the x-axis uh, is a temporal scale, thinking about events that are happening in milliseconds all the way to events that are happening uh, on the order of years. And we think of environmental neuroscience as being this multi-scale science that spans many spatial and temporal scales. Um, and today I'm gonna to show you um, some of our research and, and how it sort of maps on to these different um, temporal and spatial scales. So one of, the, one of the first studies that I wanted to talk to you about was a study we did uh, in Toronto looking to see um, if there was an independent relationship between health in a neighborhood and the amount of green space in the neighborhood, and whether proximity to green spaces would be associated uh, with positive health incomes, outcomes, uh, controlling for uh, many different confounding factors. Why did we uh, look at Toronto? Well, Toronto, I was happened to be doing my postdoc in Toronto at the time, um, and Toronto had some really interesting data sets that allowed us to interrogate this question. So what I'm showing you here uh, is a map of, of Toronto. Uh, Toronto is broken up into these things called dissemination areas, uh, which you can think of sort of being like census tracts in the United States. Dissemination areas contain about 300 to 700 people in them. You can see that as you get start getting towards the core of Toronto down here, the dissemination areas are getting smaller and smaller and smaller as the city is getting more dense. Um, the city varies widely in terms of the size of, of the dissemination areas where you know there's lower population density. And the areas uh, in tan were areas where we had uh, green space data and health data. So we were able to study uh, 3,202 of these dissemination areas uh, in Toronto. And we had uh, two really interesting data sets to help quantify green space. One of the data sets came from the Quickbird uh, satellite uh, where we can quantify tree canopy uh, for all these different dissemination areas. And what's being plotted here is the percentage of tree canopy in each of these dissemination areas. So areas in brighter green have higher tree canopy uh, compared to areas in, in lighter green. And we also had this other data set that was provided by the University of Toronto Forestry Department, where they actually had people go around the city of Toronto and catalog every single tree on public land. So what's being plotted here are all 580,000 trees on public land in the city of Toronto. Um, from those data, we know the species of every single tree and the diameter of each tree at breast height. So you know basically how large the tree is and the species of the tree. And using some forestry algorithms, then we can actually calculate how much tree canopy every individual tree provides in the city of Toronto. Um, so Toronto looks much greener here than it actually is. If we zoom in, this is actually High Park in Toronto, if we zoom in, you can see all the tree-lined streets going into High Park. So most of these trees are trees that are on the easement. So these are trees that are sort of in between the sidewalk and the street. And from these data, we can actually separate out the trees on public land versus the trees on private land. So subtracting out these trees from the satellite trees 
give us uh, some sort of bifurcation of trees on public land versus private land. And then we ran a, a big uh, regression. So one of the first uh, multiple regressions that we ran was a variable of health perception. So we had data from about 32,000 uh, people in Toronto that asked them a series of questions about their health. One of the questions was simply how healthy do you perceive yourself to be on a scale of one to seven? And we found that a 1% increase in health perception was associated with having 10 more trees uh, of average size per, per city block, which sounds pretty modest, but to get that equivalent increase in health perception monetarily, you would have to give every household on that city block about $10,000, have them all move to a neighborhood that had a median uh, income that was $10,000 wealthier, or uh, this was also associated with being uh, seven years younger. And I should mention too, that these are all independent effects. So each of these effects uh, we're controlling for, um, so for the tree effect, we're controlling for age, education, and income. The income effect is controlling for the trees, education, and age. The age effect is controlling for trees, income, and education. So these are all, you can get this 1% uh, increase uh, is associated with each of these independent effects. Um, I would argue from an economic standpoint, the trees would probably be the most cost-effective strategy here. Um, and, uh, but trees are not without cost, there's upkeep on trees. Um, if we look at more objective measures of health, uh, so cardiometabolic disorders, so these were questions asking people if they have diabetes, have they ever had a stroke, um, have they ever had heart disease? We found that a 1% decrease in cardiometabolic disorders was associated with having 11 more trees of average size uh, per city block. To get that equivalent decrease monetarily, you'd have to give every household on that city block about $20,000, have them all move to a neighborhood uh, that's about $20,000 wealthier or be about one and a half years younger. Uh, and again, these are all independent effects. Of course, we can't claim causality here, right? So a bad case scenario would be that just healthier people choose to live in neighborhoods um, that have more trees. Uh, but those healthier people can't be more educated, they can't be younger, and they can't be wealthier. Um, so we think we have uh, some ideas about the direction here, but we cannot make strong causal claims here. Another thing that's interesting about this data set is because it was, um, data in Ontario, where Ontario has uh, socialized health care, everyone more or less has the same health care, which is actually good. Um, but it also might mean that some of these income variables might be a bit inflated compared to the United States, uh, where in the United States, there's certainly a stronger relationship between uh, dollar and health than in uh, Canada. So we, we're, we're hoping to replicate uh, some of these uh, effects in the, in the US as well. To, to get more uh, experimental control and not looking uh, at just observational studies, we've also run experiments where we actually have people uh, walk in nature, interact with nature versus more urban areas. Uh, so we did a study uh, in Ann Arbor uh, when I was in grad school where we actually brought people into the lab, we assessed their memory and attention with a difficult working memory task, uh, a backward digit span task. Um, we gave them a series of other cognitive tasks and then we uh, gave them a map uh, and sent them a, on a walk in nature versus a walk uh, through Huron Street, through Ann Arbor's downtown to see uh, for any changes in memory and attention after walking for about 50 minutes in nature uh, versus walking uh, 50 minutes in the urban environment. Uh, so these walks were 2.8 um, miles. So it took people about 50 minutes to complete the walk. Uh, we also gave all of our participants a GPS watch. So here are actually the GPS traces of some of our participants going on these walks. So we could ensure that they didn't just go to Starbucks that they actually uh, went on the walk. So participants came into the lab, we assessed their memory and attention. We sent them on a walk in nature or a walk on an urban environment. Uh, they came back to the lab, we assessed their memory and attention again. And then they came back to the lab a week later and repeated the whole procedure. Uh, but if they walked in nature the first week, 
uh, they walked in an urban environment the second week or vice versa. And what did we find? Well, we actually found uh, that people improved significantly on this backwards span task um, after walking in nature, uh, but didn't really show much of an improvement after walking in the urban environment. And this was a significant interaction. So people were uh, significantly improving their uh, working memory uh, performance as measured by this backward digispan task after walking in nature compared to the urban environment. Um, and if you're not familiar with the backward digits band task, basically you, you heard digits um, auditorily, so like five, six, seven, uh, and then you would need to repeat them back in backwards order. Uh, so say seven, six, five, uh, three digits, the task is really easy at around five or six digits, it gets really, really hard. Um, and we went up to about nine or 10 digits. So people improved by about a digit and a half after walking in nature uh, compared to the urban environment. And uh, we actually get some similar effects if you show people nature pictures uh, versus urban pictures or have people listen to nature sounds versus urban sounds, suggesting to us that there's actually something about the perceptual features of nature that leads to these benefits. The fractal structure of nature, the information entropy of nature, the color palette of nature, that somehow our brains um, maybe sort of optimize the process and that can lead to cognitive benefits. Um, to kind of talk more about this aesthetic element, um, you may be familiar with this seminal study by Roger Ulrich in the early 80s, where he was looking at the recovery of uh, patients from gallbladder surgery. Um, and he had access to the patients here on this corridor. Some of the patients in this hospital in Philadelphia had views of nature here and others had views more of like a brick wall from these rooms over here. And it turns out the patients that had the views of nature, they recovered from gallbladder surgery about a day earlier and they used less uh, analgesics, less pain uh, medications than the patients that had the views of the brick wall. Suggesting again that there's something about the aesthetic of nature that's leading to these benefits, because I'd probably argue that there weren't differences in air quality here, uh, likely not differences in exercise between these two groups. I should also mention too, that the patients are randomly assigned to the room. So it wasn't like wealthier patients or younger patients had views of nature, they were just randomly assigned. But the fact that you get these effects just from a, a visual of nature, um, has really got us interested to know, well, what is it about the visual patterns of nature or the acoustic patterns of nature that might lead to these benefits? So what we've begun to do with um, computer vision algorithms and machine learning algorithms is that we can take a scene and basically decompose it down into its low level visual quality. So here's a scene of mixed natural urban uh, content. Um, it's actually a a park that I'll talk about later that we analyzed um, with some diary analysis, journal diary analysis, but we can take this scene with mixed natural urban content and we can quantify all the curved edges and all the, the straight lines in the scene. So all the green lines here are quantifying all the curved or non-straight edges in the scene. The magenta lines are quantifying all the straight edges in the scene. And from that, we can say, well, if a scene differs in the amount of curved edges or fractal structure, does that lead to changes in some kind of behavioral performance measure? So one of the things uh, that we did is, is, is if, you, if I go back a slide, sorry, and show you the scene. This scene uh, is a park that was built by the TTF Foundation. All of the parks have these benches and underneath the bench is a journal uh, where people actually uh, write down some of their thoughts when they're sitting in these parks. And what we did is we actually analyzed the park entries uh, from these parks. So there are about 30 parks and about 12,000 uh, journal entries in total. And we ran a LDA, uh, a, a latent Deary Clay analysis, which is sort of a topic modeling analysis on these journal entries. And we found 10 major topics that people sort of wrote about when they're in these parks. So one of the themes was about religion. Uh, one of them was about park. One of them we labeled as time and memories. 
another one that I want to draw your attention to here is this topic right here uh, that was labeled as spiritual and life journey. Uh, and we actually found that um, some of the, the actual visual features of the park actually influenced uh, what people wrote about. So here's a, an example of journal entry of what somebody wrote about in one of these parks. Uh, actually, this park was associated with a church. Uh, here's a picture of the park. Here's the journal entry uh, that the person wrote. So cold day, hard to write, but I've been thinking often. And what we can do here is we can quantify from this journal entry, it's loading on those 10 different themes. So this loaded very heavily on this spiritual and life journey topic. Uh, it had about 13% loading on time and memories and about a 5% loading on life and emotion. And then we had pictures from these parks and we ran our machine learning algorithms on, on these pictures. And we quantified basically how many, how much curved edge structure was there in the park. So this park had a 0.14 curved edge structure. And we also had on Amazon Mechanical Turk, we had people rate uh, all these parks for how natural they thought they were. And this, this uh, park received a natural score of 4.35. And then we ran some correlations. So one of the first correlations as a sanity check was uh, if we look at the nature topic, which was one of the 10 topics that people wrote about, does that correlate with the perceived naturalness of the park? And it does. We see a correlation of about 0.52. So MTurk raters uh, who rated how natural the park were, their uh, naturalness ratings correlated with people who are actually in the park and what they wrote about. <laughs> so people that were in these parks that were rated as being more natural actually wrote more about themes that were related to nature. So that was one of our first sanity checks. But we found something kind of interesting, which is that if these parks had more curved edge structure that we actually quantified with our computer vision algorithms, uh, people wrote more about topics related to spirituality in their life journey. So we found this association between how much curved edge structure there was in the park with how much people thought about the spiritual and life journey topic. To get more at causality, we actually uh, decoupled um, or manipulated the amount of curved edges in an image and the naturalness in the image. So for example, moving from left to right here, these images on the right have the same amount of uh, curved edge structure and they have more curved edge structure than these, but these images are rated more natural on the top here than these images down here. So we have like a two by two design. We're manipulating um, the amount of curved edge structure and also the naturalness of the images because there are actually is a confound that uh, images that have more curved edge structure people think of as being more natural. So what we did is we created uh, these sort of piles of images that had uh, equal curved edge density, but one was more natural and one was less natural. Um, these images here, this has less curved edge density than this image, but they have the same naturalness rating. So we could decouple these two features. And then what we did is we showed people uh, a single image online and asked them which one of these um, sort of thought clouds goes the best with this image. And what we found is that when the images were more natural or rated as more natural, uh, that predicted people picking the, the thought cloud that was related more to naturalness. So that was another sanity check. Um, but what was even more interesting is that uh, the images, if they had more curved edge structure, people were 1.6 times more likely to pick the topic that was related to this spiritual and life journey topic from before. So um, this sort of gave us some sort of causal evidence that maybe having more curved edge structure and image does cause people to think more about spirituality in their life journey. To get, uh, <laughs> to get even crazier, we said, well, do you even need to know what the image is? Can you get these effects just from the low level visual features? So we had in the lab, we've created um, an algorithm where we can take an image 
and decompose it into its low level visual features, but then scramble it. So this image right here is a scramble of this image up here. It's got the same number of curved and straight edges as this one up here, but you don't really know what it is. And it turns out that if you're exposed to images like this that have more curved edge structure versus less, even though they're completely nonsensical images, you're still one and a half times more likely to pick the spiritual and life journey topic if you see images that have higher curved edge structure, even with no semantics. Um, so that's signaling to us that um, this may really have to do with some relationship between these low level perceptual features and, and thoughts, which is um, pretty interesting that um, just seeing this kind of Jackson policy kind of um, image uh, that doesn't really have any semantic information um, leads to reliable um, predictions of, of what people will be thinking about, in this case, these spiritual and life journey topics. Okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll pause here for a minute just in case anybody has a question. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll just keep barreling through. I had a quick question about um, in the beginning when you were doing the um, the satellite of or I or guess when people were going around and raiding and you had like the on um, in I forgot the, in Canada Toronto yeah in Toronto yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Toronto um, so are were the surveys done at the same time in two thousand six when you had that data? Or is it at a different time point when you get the survey data from the participants? And if it's at different times, how do you, yeah. I guess? Yeah, they were, at, they were at different times. So the satellite data was from 2006. The health data was from 2010. And I think the individual tree data was from around 2009. Um, it's not ideal. Um, there's not a lot of huge change in green space, you know, over that over that time period. So I'm not too worried about that. But I think um, moving forward, that's actually something that we're kind of interested in is actually having time series data. This mm -hmm. will also help us with causal claims that if we see some change in green space, do we see that um, concaminant change in um, health? Okay. Maybe Mark, if I may, just a super quick question for you, because I, I love your work, uh, Paul Thompson here. You mentioned briefly uh, the fractal structure of images. Did you have a look at some other mathematical descriptors of the complexity of the scene? Because I, I feel like that's a really fascinating line of, line of work also. Yeah, we, we also looked at grayscale entropy, um, which was another measure. Uh, we, had the, we had the fractal measure. They all are uh, a little bit correlated with each other because they're, they're very heavily related to this uh, amount of edges basically in the scene. Um, we haven't yet gone much deeper than that, but actually Paul, so I, I was doing my um, sabbatical in Toronto in the computer science department. And I, I actually, one of the things that I wanted to do was to use deep learning, deep neural nets to actually classify nature versus urban scenes and then see what features the, the deep neural nets were getting out um, that those might be some other kind of feature that I wouldn't even thought about that's actually differing between these two scenes. And maybe that is a feature that might be producing some of these benefits. So yeah, I think it's a really, it's a really good question and something you know, that we're interested in and want to try to understand more. Really cool. Thanks, Mark. So, so one of the things that um, we think about in the lab too is that uh, we think that um, nature, when we interact with nature, it can sort of um, restore or replenish um, cognitive resources, and in particular, a resource that we call directed attention or that might be called top-down attention, which is sort of our, the attention that we use um, when we're in class or when we're working, this sort of human ability to to direct our focus on some kind of task, um, even if it might not be the most interesting task in the world. Um, so presumably right now, you guys are trying to pay attention to what I'm saying. Um, it's taking directed attention to do it. Um, 
And we think that that ability to direct attention is fatigable or depletable, that you can only direct your attention for so long before you become mentally fatigued and you can't do it anymore. And I see this all the time, you know, the first five minutes of lecture, people are pretty engaged. And then about 45 minutes into lecture, I see a lot of head nodding back because people just have a hard time directing their attention. They get mentally fatigued. And we think that kind of attention is sort of different than involuntary or bottom-up attention that's automatically captured by interesting stimulation in the environment. So we think what's going on is that when you interact with nature, you're not placing a lot of demands on directed attention while sort of activating this involuntary or bottom-up attention. And that allows you to sort of replenish this um, directed attention resource. And we think this directed attention resource is also critical, not just for working memory and executive functioning, but also for self-control. That when you become mentally fatigued, you're less able to sort of control impulses, uh, which actually might lead to more aggressive behavior. So there has been some interesting work um, from Ming Kuo and Bill Sullivan. Uh, they did these studies in Chicago. Uh, where they looked at uh, public housing projects in Chicago. So this is from the Ida Wells Public Housing Facility uh, in Chicago. So here's an example of a poor nature view from the Ida Wells uh, Public Housing Facility. Here's an example of a good nature view. So they actually looked at the views from these different apartments uh, in these public housing projects. And what they found is that uh, in these public housing projects that had more vegetation around them, there were less reported crimes in those in those public housing projects. And what's interesting here too is that uh, it's a quasi experimental study that people are sort of randomly assigned to these different uh, public housing projects. So rooms, it's not like wealthier people get the nature view and, and less wealthy people uh, get the worst nature view. People are randomly assigned. Uh, so there was a significant association between the amount of vegetation around uh, your public housing uh, apartment and the amount of crime. In another public housing project, these are the Robert Taylor homes. Uh, they looked at a similar thing, but this time uh, Quo and Sullivan had measures of aggression and they found that when there was more uh, modest nature around uh, the public housing project, there was less reported aggression, less range of aggressive tactics and higher attention as measured by this backwards digit span task. And when they ran a statistical model, they found that actually the attention improvements mediated the relationship between aggression and uh, green space. So they, the sort of the causal path might be that green space improves attention and then that reduces aggression, uh, which is kind of in line with this attention restoration theory. Um, so these are pretty compelling uh, evidence that uh, small tweaks to the physical environment can have uh, profound impacts on behavior. It's also interesting too, that if you ask these residents, if they notice nature out of their window, they, they don't. Um, these are very implicit effects. So it's not like the people that had views of nature are staring out the window all day long and the people that don't have the view of nature aren't. Um, these seem to be rather in, implicit kinds of effects, which I think is also uh, very interesting. So we tried to um, sort of build off of these uh, results, looking at cell phone trace data um, to look at people's behaviors in addition to the amount of static green space uh, around their home. So we had uh, cell phone trace data from 100,000 Chicagoans and 200,000 New Yorkers. Uh, the cell phone trace data came from one month of tracking in 2017. So basically, we know exactly where people live and where they go for the whole month of May in 2017. And from those data, uh, we quantified uh, a few different behaviors. So one behavior that we quantified was how often do you leave your neighborhood and go and visit a park outside of your neighborhood? We also looked at, so that was our measure of park visits. Uh, we also looked at in your neighborhood, how many people are outside of the home uh, at any one time, which is sort of our measure of street activity or what Jane Jacobs would call sort of eyes on the street. And we related uh, both of these factors to, to crime. Um, and what we found was, was rather interesting. So I'm showing you three maps uh, of Chicago. The, the first map is just a map where we've quantified the amount of tree canopy 
uh, across different neighborhoods in Chicago and related that to crime in Chicago, controlling for our age, education, income, um, ethnicity, you know, all the demographic confounding variables you can think of. And we found that if you increase tree canopy by about 5%, that would be related to about a 3% reduction in crime. Um, to look at that economically, to get that equivalent uh, reduction in crime, you would need to take 9% of the population out of poverty. If we look at street activity, or here I call it social cohesion, so this is the amount of time that people are outside of the neighborhood uh, potentially interacting with each other. We don't know if they're interacting with each other, but we know that they're all outside of the home in the neighborhood at the same time. We find that that's also related to less crime. So increasing street activity by 5% was related to a 7% reduction in crime. To get that equivalent uh, decrease in crime, you would need to take 21% of the population out of poverty. And if we look at park visits, so this is you leaving your neighborhood and going to a, another neighborhood and visiting a park. So we wanted to make sure it's not about your neighborhood, it's about you leaving your neighborhood and going to another neighborhood and visiting a park. Um, how is that related to crime uh, in your neighborhood? And we found that if you increased um, park visits by one visit per month, that was related to a 1% um, a 14% reduction in crime to get that equivalent um, decrease uh, in crime economically, you would have to take 41% of the population out of, out of poverty. So uh, again, correlational, but pretty significant effects of uh, this intentional interaction with nature on uh, crime in your neighborhood. Um, I'm not going to show you all the num numbers, but we did the same exact analysis in New York and we found the exact same thing. Um, that all these variables were also related uh, to reductions in crime. So just to, to give you an interim summary here. So uh, we find that interactions with nature, even if they're quite brief, can have significant effects on mental and physical health. Um, the nature exposures can even be simulations, uh, pictures, sounds, uh, just looking out the window, uh, and even perceiving some of just the low level features of nature uh, may be salubrious to psychological functioning, like just the curved edge structure, uh, the entropy, the, the fractalness, devoid of the semantic content might have some of the same effects. Uh, we've also collaborated with an architect, uh, Alex Coburn, um, where we looked at building facades and building interiors and if buildings that have no nature, but if they have more fractal structure. So you can imagine a Gaudi building in Barcelona, which has a lot of fractal, fractal patterns, uh, a lot of curved edge structure that mimics the patterns of nature. People prefer those scenes and rate them uh, as being more natural. So the question is, can you even get some of these effects even just from architecture? So one of the things that we're very interested in is, can you improve cities by incorporating natural elements, having you know, more green space, more trees, but also actually even changing the architecture of the city? Okay, and then in the last, last part here, I wanted to kind of talk about something a little bit different. It's the physical environment, but it's not green space per se, um, but looking at how cities change as they get larger, uh, how that affects our social networks and how that might affect depression incidents. So um, there, there has been a lot of work on uh, sort of the infrastructure networks of cities, how that impacts our social networks and how that impacts a whole host of different um, metrics like GDP and innovation and things like that. But we are interested in seeing, okay, how does the infrastructure of a city change as it gets bigger and how might that influence uh, depression incidents? So there has been uh, you know, quite a bit of work on social network determinants of depression, um, that the risk of depression is inversely proportional to social connectivity. So if, you're, if your social networks are sort of richer, if you're connected to more people, uh, you're gonna be less likely to develop depression. And that depression tends to cluster on the periphery of networks that uh, people that are more susceptible to depression are not sort of these central hubs of social networks. They tend to lie on the periphery of, of social networks. Um, so we aim to, to sort of look at this, look at depression at a city level 
Um, and our measure uh, was for the population of a city, but, but where does a city end or begin? Well, we use something called a core-based statistical area or a CBSA. Um, so what a CBSA is, it's one or more counties um, that are associated with a city um, that are sort of socioeconomically tied and tied by transportation and commuting patterns. So for example, uh, we didn't just look at Chicago, we looked at Chicago CBSA, which, in, which includes Naperville, Elgin, uh, which I'll show you in a moment, and 15 uh, uh, counties across three different states actually. So here's, here's what the CBSA of Chicago looks like. So it's not just Cook County here that has about you know, 3 million people. It's this whole area here uh, that includes you know, Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, Elgin, parts of Indiana. It's got about 10 million people here. And uh, Luis Betancourt, one of my colleagues at the University of Chicago, he's uh, developed uh, with Jeff West um, these urban scaling laws. So how do things scale as cities get bigger? So one thing here, um, this is looking at uh, the amount of road that you have in a city. And it turns out that as cities get larger, you actually get less road per capita than you would expect by population on its own. So there's some economy of scale. So what that means is that um, you, you don't need as much road per person as cities get larger. Um, so instead of, if, if you look at Chicago versus New York, um, New York is about double the population of Chicago, but New York does not have twice as much road length as Chicago. It only has uh, uh, 0 0.84, uh, a 40, an 84% increase in road length, not a 100% increase in road length, um, which is also why New York is more congested. Um, if we look at GDP or gross domestic product um, per capita, we find super linear scaling, that actually as cities get larger, uh, so looking at, let's take Chicago versus New York again, uh, New York doesn't have 100% uh, or just a pure doubling of uh, per capita GDP. It's got this extra 16% increase uh, in GDP per capita. So there's something at, as, as cities are getting larger, you're getting actually this sort of exponential uh, growth in GDP per capita. It's not just a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. Now, this is good in terms of GDP. Uh, there are negative things like crime. Crime actually also grows super linearly as cities get bigger. And part of the thought here is that it has to do with social networks, that when cities get larger, um, I'm going to focus here, the social interactions per capita also get larger, that you're you interact with more people uh, as cities get, get larger uh, in these exponential ways. And so uh, what we thought about was, well, how might that relate to depression? So uh, here I'm just showing a, a small network here. So here's a, a node uh, in this network. This node has degree three. That means it's connected to three other nodes. Uh, this node over here, uh, has degree one, it's only connected to one other node. And what Betancourt and his colleagues has found is that actually as cities get larger, average degree increases um, by a super linear amount. You get more uh, connections per capita than just city size alone. So we wondered, well, if city, if your mean degree increases with city size, and if depression might be uh, related to your social network degree, maybe inversely, that maybe actually depression will be reduced as cities get larger uh, because you're more connected and that might have some buffering uh, against depression. So we built a simulation uh, based on this. I, I won't get too into the details, um, but actually we, were, we modeled uh, your mean network degree to grow according to the log skew normal distribution as, as cities get larger. Uh, so what this means that in a large city, you might have um, on average be connected to 2.5 people. 
In a smaller city, you might be connected on average to 1.7 people. And if your susceptibility to depression is related to the inverse of your uh, degree, so just one over degree, in a larger city, you're gonna have uh, people that are gonna be less susceptible to depression. But in a smaller city, you're gonna have more people that are gonna be susceptible to depression. And here's the results of our simulation. So we ran a, a simulation of this and we found that in fact, yes, according to the simulation, we would expect that as cities get larger, um, depression would scale sublinearly um, with an exponent of, of five, six. So not uh, matching one, but being less than one. So you're, as cities get larger, you're getting less depression per capita than would be expected by city size alone. And interestingly enough too, this is matching uh, sort of the exponent that we, that Luis Bencourt finds with road, road length. And then we actually had data from three different data sets um, quantifying depression. So we had data from the CDC uh, that quantified depression with surveys. Uh, we also had data um, from interviews uh, uh, from people for this BRFSS uh, data set that quantified depression uh, across different cities. Uh, and then we also had data from Twitter uh, where there are some computer scientists that actually built a machine learning algorithm to convert tweets into a PHQ-9 depression inventory. And from that, we had uh, thousands of tweets and we could quantify uh, how depressive the tweets were basically. And the tweets were geocoded to cities and we could say, okay, how much depression uh, is there in these cities uh, based on this Twitter analysis. And across all three data sets, we find the same thing, that as cities get larger, there's less depression incidence. And again, matching uh, the results of road length um, and the growth of, of social interactions uh, that Luigi Battencourt was finding. So we found that to be pretty, pretty interesting. Um, now, what, what I think is kind of crazy about this is that if you think about something like depression, which is so incredibly complicated, that's related to your age, your wealth, your social support, your family history, your genetic predisposition, your brain structure and function, how many adverse effects you're having. And we're basically saying, averaging across all of that stuff in a city, we basically, all we need to know is how big the city is. And we can uh, sort of predict depression incidents, um, which, which in some sense is kind of crazy that you could summarize something so complex uh, with such a simple um, scaling relationship. And we also think that this means that uh, depression, which I think, you know, I'm not an expert on depression, but I've done some research on depression, that often depression is thought of as a very sort of individual phenomenon, how you're construing things in your environment. Um, but here we're sort of saying, well, depression may be this sort of aggregated social phenomenon, um, aggregated to these social networks that are influenced by the larger infrastructure of the environment that you're around. And it doesn't mean that individual differences don't matter, but it, but it is interesting that um, sort of smearing or averaging over these individual differences that we can find these kind of gross level relationships. So where do we wanna take this? Well, we wanna, you know, back to that first slide that I showed, you know, we wanna look at these effects at different scales. So looking at this large um, spatial scale of cities, but maybe taking it down to neighborhoods and families and individuals and their individual brain networks to see how are these different complex systems interacting with each other um, that might be related to, to models of depression. Um, and it's gonna be complicated, um, but, I, but I think it's something that we're trying to make progress on now. Um, and just to conclude, I think I'm, I'm running out of time here, but um, I wanna stress that the physical, and I don't, I'm preaching to the choir here, but, uh, I wanna stress that the physical environment that surrounds us can have profound impacts on our behavior and health. And often we're, we're not even aware of them. Um, and I think this is something that um, people in the general public need to take to heart more that um, the physical and social environment that surrounds us has this profound impact on our behavior. And, and oftentimes we're not aware of it. Um, 
And I think as humans, because we have so much control over our environment, we think we're kind of immune to the environment, but that, that's sort of a fallacy. One of the environments that we tend to focus on is the natural environment and how we might be able to improve physical and mental health um, through interactions with natural environments. Um, the physical structure of the environment, how the roads are, are working, how that infrastructure changes as cities get bigger, affects our social networks, it affects our behavior and it affects our mental health. And I think the, you know, the billion dollar question is, is how are we gonna use this knowledge to begin to optimize and to design the built environment in ways that improve human psychological functioning because the built environment has not been designed really with people in mind. It's been designed to move goods efficiently, to house people efficiently, but it hasn't been designed to have people have the highest working memory capacity that they have or to have the best emotional well being. Um, so I think that's something that we're really interested in is to say, okay, what can we do to cities and houses and you know, basically all built environments to alter them or design them in ways that improve human psychological function. So thank you so much uh, for your time. And I, I really enjoyed meeting with all of you and, uh, and then thanks again. Well, thank you, Mark. I mean, there's so many topics here. I suspect there are a number of questions. I'd like to open this up uh, for discussion. Uh, from any questions from anyone, uh, I suppose we could try you raising your hands or just blurting out a question and see how out of control it gets. But uh, um, uh, so the floor is open for any questions. Well, I have one to start and I wanna uh, revisit the, the comments you had about uh, particularly in the housing projects and the view of nature versus the view of a block wall sort of a, approach and issues. I, I found really fascinating this notion that uh, to some extent, the view of actual nature was, and the view of sort of simulations of nature, uh, you know, was, was also a, a, a benefit over just a block walls or a brick wall sort of view. Uh, and it gets me to thinking about the, you know, I can understand the notion of, you know, just looking at a block wall. And even if there were a mural or some poster or something on it, uh, you know, floor to ceiling poster, and that, that would be better. Uh, I'm not sure I quite buy the notion. I mean, it, it almost sounds like you're saying that if we had a picture or a poster over the window that they'd look out and sort of see, you know, a, a vista, uh, that that would be, that would work too. Uh, is there data on that or do, or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think it's kind of like a, um, I, don't know if, I don't know if a Russian doll is the right example, but, um, you know, a picture might be better than nothing. <laughs> the window outside to nature is better than the picture, the walk is better than the, the view, you know, so, so the more, um, the more sort of interactive it is, the more immersive it is, um, we think the, the, the bigger the effect is going to be. Um, and there have been studies that have compared sort of a view of nature versus an LCD screen of nature um, the LCD screen gives some benefits, but not as much as the view out to nature. Um, I certainly don't want to be advocating that simulated nature is uh, a replacement for actual nature, because actually we find that the real thing does lead to better benefits. Um, but if you can't get the real thing, you could still potentially get some benefit from the simulated uh, nature. All right, but it raises interesting questions about how we might uh, design interior surfaces, for example, just a regular, just a regular yellow or white block wall. Maybe we sort of have a mural on every wall or something. Well, or a green wall. I mean, that's you know getting actually real nature incorporated into the indoor environment, and and I think there's actually air quality benefits to some of those things too. So I think it's kind of like trying to bring nature in because we can't we don't have the space, we can't all have these great views of nature. And I, I'm certainly not one to say, let's get rid of cities and all move out to the country. I think we wanna preserve the nature that's out there. But I think there are ways that we can kind of bring nature more into our cities and into our interiors uh, that can have benefits. Yeah, and I, one of our colleagues, Suzanne Paulson is on here, I see and done a lot of work in thinking about, you know, 
vegetation and its potential uh, impacts on, on improving the environmental exposures, maybe not so much indoors, but certainly along roadways and you know, for schools and so forth. Yeah, um, yes, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for calling me out, Ed. Um, I, it was a really, really fascinating talk. Um, trees are, are so complicated um, in urban environments. And I think that they're even a little bit more complicated here than they are in a place like Chicago or in, in many places where there's something that, that uh, many of us envy, which is lots of water coming from the sky. Um, um, but with regard to trees, I hear so many different things in, in, in low SES communities. Um, people sometimes say they don't want trees because thugs can hide in them and shoot them from them. A lot of, um, obviously a lot of crime happens in parks. Um, and so there are these negative aspects and then also um, potentially some trees produce volatile organic compounds that contribute to ozone, which is another big problem that we have here. We have tremendous problems with, with drought. Um, we have we have thousands of trees that are um, dying or dead as a result of drought we had a few years ago. Potentially we're going into another drought. It's been a very dry winter so far. Um, so, so I wonder sort of putting all these things together, how you, um, how you begin to kind of approach that. If we think about, about what kind of trees we want in an urban environment and then in the, additional complications of our, our very Mediterranean climate and also changing climate here in LA and other cities. How do you think about that? Yeah, it's a really <laughs> issue. Um, you know, so I'll, I guess I'll start with the, the park one and, you know, maybe uh, some communities being resistant to, to getting increases in green space. I think that's a that's a big issue and we don't wanna be paternalistic in our work. Um, so we're trying to partner more with um, community groups and neighborhoods and um, seeing what they want um, and trying, trying to go from there. A, a lot of times too in those neighborhoods, they, they maybe have a park, like you said, but it's not safe to go to the park. Um, that's something, and I talked to some of you about this uh, too, we partnered with an organization called MAPS Corps where they have hundreds of students um, that go around different neighborhoods with smart technology then map out resources in their neighborhood. And we partnered with them to actually map out the green space resources in the neighborhood and think about park quality uh, and things like that to see you know, if there's a park right across the street uh, is it safe or not? Um, because from satellite imagery or even the park maps, we don't know that. Um, so getting that information would be really, really important. Um, yeah, the Chicago tree canopy is gonna have quite different needs than the LA uh, tree canopy. So for example, in the Midwest, we've had to fight with the emerald ash borer bug that basically killed all the ash trees. So there's, you know, we shouldn't be planting ash trees because they're not going to make it. <laughs> um, I think meeting with the biodiversity of the location is a good place to start. So native species probably are going to do a lot better um, than, than non-native and taking all the ecology into account. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's really, really complicated. So in Chicago, they have the opposite problem. They're using green space to control water and flooding. <laughs> um, and, and LA is going to have a whole other host of different problems. But I'd, I'd be hopeful that, you know, maybe there, there are some vegetation species that, that don't require too much, too much water that can still be maintained. But you also need community buy-in. And, and we actually find too, that you can map out like 311 calls for, um, tree you know repair and stuff like that and neighborhoods differ in terms of how how much you know people are sort of looking after the trees and but then that gets into the deeper issues too about whether people trust you know that the government is going to do anything if they if they make a complaint so these are really really complicated issues that we're we're trying to kind of sift our way through 
Other questions from the from the uh, attendees? I have a question. Go ahead, Alyssa. Um, hi. Um, I'm not sure if I can phrase this properly, but for the Twitter study where the PHQ9 algorithm for depressing tweets and geolocations was done, um, I'm wondering if there was any interest or further mining to measure if in those densely populated areas, if green space or tree canopy was also present. Because I'm thinking about cities like Atlanta and Chicago, which are a bit greener by nature, they are also densely populated. So I'm just, that was a very interesting slide to think about uh, more population density actually being a buffer for depression. Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of, a, it's a really interesting question. And uh, we actually have a collaborator in the forestry department who we could, who we might be able to partner with to kind of, to kind of look at that. In fact, you can even see if the tweet came from a location where somebody was in a park <laughs> or not, and how that might impact, you know, thought content and depressive um, symptoms. One, one thing that's interesting about the depression study is that um, it's not scaling with population density. So actually population density scales even more, um, with uh, city size than the social network. So, um, you know, you can imagine like a, a skyscraper, it's got a huge population density, but that actually doesn't increase your social network by that much. So in fact, like um, COVID-19, uh, we've done a study of this, COVID-19 does not spread by population density, it actually spreads by your social network. Um, if, it, if it's spread by population density, New York should have much more COVID-19 incidents than it, than it did early in the pandemic. So it actually is about your, your social connectivity and how that changes by the infrastructure of the city. Um, I think maybe I'm mistaken, but I think factoring green space in might be another way to even add more to the model because the model is not perfect. Uh, so you could imagine, like you said, Atlanta that has more green space um, and maybe it's got the same size as, as another city, um, maybe, you know, Chicago and Atlanta are pretty similar. Uh, if Atlanta does have more green space, does it actually have even less uh, depression per capita than Chicago because of this increase in green space? I think that would be really interesting to look at. Still time for one or two more questions if someone has one. Great, Bill. Yeah, hi. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, with respect to the sort of the cognitive uh, impact of of uh, walking through a park, as opposed to walking through a city cityscape, I'm curious as to what. And that's a very you know a short short walk, relatively short walk. What is what's been done with um, if exposure to uh, an atmosphere that's very slightly. Mo uh, 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 changed relative to another atmosphere that is a certain oxygen content co content we know you go on and on has that kind of thing been done and in other words what are the short term cognitive effect of a you know minor tweak in uh, atmospheric composition that is you know, inhaled yeah I'm, I'm not an expert on that but i do think there are some studies that look at that and have found that when you worse in the air quality that does have, um, even on the short term scale, that, that can have impacts on cognitive processing, worse cognitive processing. Um, I'd have to dig them up, but I, I have run across some of those, some of those papers. Oh, even on the, even on the time scale of, of minutes even or hours. Yeah. Even on a brief time scale. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Other, other questions, comments? Yeah, chaining on to that, can um, does it matter if it's sunny or it's or if it's raining <laughs> or if it's you know negative twenty or whatever it is in Chicago sometimes? Yeah, so in in the walk study, um, it matters for the mood effects, but it doesn't matter for the cognitive effects. So walking in January when it was twenty five degrees Fahrenheit, people showed the same working memory and attention benefit as the people that walked in July when it was eighty degrees Fahrenheit. They didn't like the walk as much, but they showed the same cognitive benefit. 
Um, so what about the depression? Well, I guess you weren't looking at depression, but what would you? That one we didn't, yeah, we didn't look at depression there. We did run the same study with participants with depression. And um, we actually had participants um, ruminate about a negative memory before they went on the walk. And we actually found even stronger effects um, for the participants who are diagnosed with depression than our non-clinical sample. So the nature walk was actually improved their working memory more so than the non-clinical sample. Um, I don't have anything about, you know, going on the walk on a cloudy day versus not. Um, and if that would have some impact on depression, my hunch would be no, but I, but I don't know. That's a empirical question. And certainly this, you know, there's this whole this seasonal affective disorder. Um, but I wonder if part of that might be that people don't go out in nature, they stay inside more. So I wonder if you were outside just as much as you were uh, in the summer months, maybe that might get rid of that effect. Uh, you know, part of what we're saying is that it would. I have a, a follow-up question, Mark. I'm turning in my head, you know, this, this idea, some of my work has looked at exercise in the adolescent brain as well, without the environmental context. I'm wondering, has there been any studies to suggest, like the, going back to other people's questions about interior aesthetics, like in terms of, you know, if you were to run in a gym that had lots of, you know, an atrium in it, has anyone tried to create kind of that context of aerobic fitness, which we know is good for mental health, but also making those gyms less sterile? Has that been anything that you've seen people talk I'll, about? I'll have to, I'll have to dig it up, but I definitely saw a paper where like running on a treadmill, people ran longer if it was like, if they were watching, you know, those like bikes where you can like bike on a nature trail, urban one, you like biked or ran longer if it was nature versus urban. Um, but nothing where I they kind of tried to make the gym more feel like- I that. have not seen, I have not seen that, but that, yeah. you know, I have not seen that. Um, but but that would be my my hunch is that if it's more pleasing yeah uh, with this nature element that that people would exercise more longer yeah okay. longer yep any i have a yes oliver please go on yeah so mine's not really a question but just some um updates <laughs> so some little work that we're doing here at the university of southern california so uh, i work in the office for health function strategy and what we do is try to implement different types of strategies uh, to promote and improve student well-being across campus. And this past year, we included a new module of um, subjective, subjective findings of students and how they perceive nature on a college setting. And if you know, in Los Angeles, it's pretty much metropolitan, so it's more urban setting. And um, we cross-tabulated it with other factors such as sense of belonging, you know, things that impact student well-being, so sense of belonging, um, mental health, alcohol consumption, and even the idea of inclusion and equity. And we're still waiting to do this, but eventually we're gonna have some data on how one's perception of nature um, it may or may not have a relationship with their sense of belonging with their community. And I'd be, I'd be curious if you came across any other research um, that looked at you know, behavioral outcomes, well-being outcomes, and the relationship with nature. But that's just yeah, something that, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, Oliver. We we haven't published it yet, but we did a study where we um, sent people to walk in the Garfield Conservatory, which is a, like an indoor conservatory park, nature park, pretty cool place. And also had them walk in the Water Tower Mall on the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in Chicago. Um, and uh, we did ecological momentary assessment. So they had these cell phones that would ping them every so often and ask them what they were thinking about. And it turns out when people were in nature, they thought more about other people than they thought about themselves. Uh -huh. And what's interesting about that is that there were actually the same number of people around in both locations. So we also calculated how many people are around. So it wasn't like in nature, there were more or less people, but same amount of people around, but in nature, you thought more about others uh, and felt more connected to, to other wow. people uh, than just thinking about the self. So I think that's kind of related. That's great. And, and especially during a time of COVID when people already feel alone, yeah. that this is something that we can put into practice. Yeah, that's great. 
All right. Any any last questions? We're just about out of time. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, Mark. I want to thank you for taking the moment the uh, morning of your time to spend with us in a number of meetings. Uh, we will uh, provide, and we certainly from environmental health, we will be following up with you from a number of our colleagues, but we invite any other, anybody else to also uh, contact. And if you have uh, issues or questions about how to get in touch with Mark, uh, please contact us, environmental health. I want to remind you that this kicks off our 2021 uh, seminar series for our, our NIHS center. And our next one will be on Friday, February 5th. These are first Friday of the month activities. On Friday, February 5th, Dr. Phil Landrigan from Boston College will be with us. And Phil has done uh, uh, careers, well, a number of different uh, career types of work, but his, his uh, presentation to us in February 5th will be talking about climate change some of the work he's done on both the world and national stage and thinking about climate change and its impacts on health. Phil, of course, is a, is a internationally renowned uh, pediatrician and environmental health researcher. And so we'll look forward to that and invite you all to come back and participate with us. So thank you again, Mark, for a really a fascinating discussion. Get us all thinking about uh, what we look at, what we see, how we get around. Uh, I think I'll uh, go out and commune with nature. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mark. This was a fantastic way to start the year, and I'm really thankful for uh, spending the morning with us. My, my pleasure. I, I really enjoyed it, and really nice meeting all of you. And we will certainly be following up with you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Great. Bye-bye to all of you. Bye.